Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is Chad Kelly, who's from a little audio company outside of Austin called Warm Audio. But first, let's talk about how your tastes in music freeze at age 33. Yeah, it seems like it's true. There's a study that was done using data from both Spotify and a data collection company called the Echo Nest that discovered that by the time you hit 33, all of a sudden, your taste in music kind of freeze. They don't change. So we don't discover music after that point. Now, it's most of us. Musicians, basically anybody listening to this show, pretty much has to at least listen to new music because that's part of the business that we're in. So we're used to discovering music. Whether we like it or not, we discover it. That being said, the average person, they kind of change by age 33. They stop looking for new music. And it's actually before that, at about age 25, is when they begin to revert back to what they were listening to while they're teenagers. Now, again, if you're past the age of 33, just begin to think about the music that you like the best. And I bet it's the music that you grew up with when you were in your teens. That's kind of natural. And it turns out that's the way it works for almost everybody. Now, it turns out that if you have children earlier than age 33, that stops your music discovery as well. So it's possible that you can freeze your musical tastes even earlier than age 33 when children come on the scene. Those of us in the music business know how much life can get in the way of music. As you get older, as you get a family, let's face it, there are things that are very important that cause us to put our attention in other places than in the thing that we love the best, which is music. And that's just the way it goes. But not only for us as musicians, producers, engineers, people in the music business, of course it works for people that love music that aren't in the music business, only more so. So this just confirms something that I think that we all sort of intuitively knew, but now we know for sure because of this data. Then again, let me tell you that this particular study didn't come from a university. It came from somebody on a website, somebody on a blog that basically went back and looked at all of this data. But I think that empirically, we kind of know that it's the truth anyway. How about you? Are you still discovering new music? Did your taste change at 33? When do you think your tastes changed if they did? I'd like to know. So drop me a line and tell me. If you have any questions and comments, please send them to questions at bobbywinnercircle.com. Comments to the questions I just asked. Don't forget about my new coaching program. It's called 101 Mixing Tricks, Big Studio Tricks for the Small Studio. You can go to 101mixingtricks.com to learn more. Now here's something that's cool. Music has been encoded on a DNA module. This is something that was actually started last year when there was an announcement made that a British scientist called Dr. Nick Goldman discovered that he could encode computer data onto DNA molecules. And this is kind of cool because what it meant was that the whole realm of data storage could possibly change. How that data is stored, where it's stored, how much is stored. I mean, think about it. If you could store it on your body, all your backup is actually in your fingertip. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, I don't know, but it certainly is interesting. Well, to take it one step further, Dr. Goldman got together with a performance artist called Charlotte Jarvis, and they put together a little Kickstarter campaign because they wanted to try something out. Instead of using human DNA, they were going to use artificial DNA, synthetic DNA, in this case a soap bubble that they would encode an mp3 upon. So they commissioned some special music from the Kreutzer string quartet that they could actually encode on these soap bubbles. And the whole idea was to have a performance space, or in this case spaces that they would have in different places, that the listener could be bathed in these soap bubbles. And it would become a real experience because you were feeling the music, you were hearing it and you were feeling it. And this is something completely new. How does it sound? How does it work? I don't know. All I can tell you is it's really intriguing because what it does is it opens up the possibilities for new ways of music to be distributed. Just think about it. The biggest thing that 
All of us love in life as an experience, and we'll pay more for an experience than we will for just about anything else. Especially the more well-off you are financially, having things, having items doesn't mean as much as having the experience. Just think about having this kind of musical experience where you go someplace and you can feel it. You're bathed, literally bathed in music. So this could be a new door opening for music distribution, although it's not close. This is far off. But just think of it as perhaps one day your album may be sold in a bottle of bubbles. Very interesting, huh? My guest today is Chad Kelly, and he's from Warm Audio, which is a very cool company that makes some really high-quality audio gear at some unbelievably reasonable prices. A couple of their products include the UA76, which is a very inexpensive version of the Universal Audio 1176. Very cool. And also a brand new product, the EQPWA, which is a version of a Pultec, which is very cool. Chad has a lot of experience both in the audio business and in helping to build companies. So I was really happy to speak with him from his home in Austin via Skype. Chad, tell me about Warm Audio. What's the Warm Audio story? It's really interesting. You know, um, I, I think what, what Bryce accomplished hasn't really been done yet. It, it, when you look at the website and you see what we, our products and whatnot, you kind of get the sense, yeah, that's cool, but, you know, it, not too original. It's, it's actually a lot more original than it seems like. Um, let, let's get into that. I mean, I have to kind of give you the, the preface to that to explain. Um, there's a lot of classic audio products that people love and want. API, uh, the you know, Universal Recording, now UA, 1176, Poltec, that, that type of thing. Um, you have those entities really still in business, still manufacturing. I know Pulse Techniques is back. Uh, UA has been back for quite some time. API never went away. Um, and you have, uh, you know, those products are still available, more, more or less intact. You have very high-end reproductions of those products. Uh, in some cases, like the Cartec or the Cartec Poltec or the Avitas API, sometimes you have reproductions more expensive than the originals, which is really crazy to me. Um, on the on the lower end, you have, and, and of course, you have like Purple Audio and other Summit and other people who have come close to some of these products too. Also, kind of pricey, very good products. Um, on on the other end of the spectrum, you've got your Chameleon Labs, your Golden Age projects, and you've got your really sort of budget oriented uh, quasi reproductions, I guess you'd say. And and on those products where you start getting into the affordable realm of say a Neve reproduction or the affordable realm of say an API or a Poltec reproduction, serious compromises end up being made. Um, not not disparaging those products, I understand, but you know you end up having Chinese transformers instead of say the original Carn Hills and Marinar and so forth, and um, you end up making enough compromises, often often aesthetically too, where they don't look anything like the original, and and what you're left with, to me, isn't really a reproduction of anything. So, what what Warm set out to do was to see if it was possible to structure a business in a way that we could give you a really high end reproduction of something that there really is no compromise in the audio sense uh you know they, they partnered with cinematic transformers very early on and forced a really good partnership um to where both new and reproduction transformers are being manufactured by cinematic to a really high standard um everything that warm has made so far has been fully discrete class a um discrete op amps reproductions of say the melcore 1731 and the jensen 918 things that you would find in really high-end preamps um and, and so, you know, the idea was to come out with a reproduction that could compete with the most expensive stuff out there sonically and, you know, and in construction and so forth, but ridiculously affordable, you know, compared to what's out there, affordable to the point that it competes with the very budget oriented sort of compromised reproductions. Um, and, and in some cases, even competes with the plug-in. Um, if you look at, say, the Deluxe 1176 suite, you know, where you have all the different 1176 uh, emulations, you know, it's about a $400 software suite, a really high-end plug-in. Um, you know, for a little more than that, you can actually buy a real physical reproduction of the 1176 LM, you know, from us. So I think that hasn't been done yet in a way that's effective. And the way we cut corners and cut costs is done in a way that doesn't affect the audio. It doesn't affect the product at all. It, it's, it's more about restructuring the company very differently. There is not an expensive building. There's not, you know, six figure salary people. There's no one in suits. There's no executives, no CEOs. There's no vice presidents. Uh, 
So we cut costs in a way that doesn't affect the consumer at all by being very frugal, very careful, very lean, uh, and working really hard and, and, and having it be more about the passion for the product than, you know, about bringing in a lot of money and so forth. We make a lot less as a company than most people do on the products that we sell. Um, so it's, uh, it's all made in the U.S. too, right? Uh, actually, no. Um, it's, it's designed uh, in the U.S., QC'd and shipped out of the U.S., but they're made for us overseas. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, it's a it's a cost saving thing. It was we've looked at it a lot of different ways and, and continue to talk about it. But um, it, at the end of the day, it was something that if it were manufactured here, we wouldn't be able to hit those prices that we try to hit. Yeah, sure. No, it makes sense. Well, let's go back a little bit. How did Bryce get into this? It, it, it's it's a jump for anybody to get into manufacturing, right. especially, you know, if you've not done it before. I don't know if he's done it before. Has he? Has he no, been? no, he had not. Um, you know, I, I had a background in pro audio. I, you know, I, I worked in sound almost my whole life. Um, but, uh, Bryce uh, has more of a business background. Um, he had worked in sales. Uh, he was a successful person before he got into audio. He was a musician. He played guitar. Uh, he's also a recording engineer who worked in recording studios. I don't believe full time, but had a lot of studio hours in under his belt. And uh, he got into it on the hobby level of trying, I believe, to sort of, you know, make your own API preamp. Uh, you know, he had, he had kind of come up with, I, I think the original one, the prototype was called Sledgehammer Audio before there was a, like a brand name. And, it, you know, it was something he had kind of built himself and was, was amazed that he could put together his own API, uh, as it were. And, and that kind of, you know, he, you know, this was when he still had a day job and it, it kind of snowballed from there where he, he got more into it and said, you know, I think I could turn this into a business. And, and, and it became one originally, you know, for, for quite the first number of years, he ran it out of his, out of his garage and various storage facilities and so forth. Um, and, and this was exactly the same story of, you know, Alesis, Mackey, Presonus, uh, all of these companies sort of came out of the garage. So it's not an unusual story in that, in that respect. Um, it's, it's just unusual that he was able to take a very lean business approach and, and make it work, make it sustainable. Uh, and, and so far it is. It's uh, everyone, I think, in, in the world told him and, 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 and me as well to an extent that, that this won't work, that you can't do it this way. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, you can't listen to critics. You've got to you've got to try. If, you're, if your gut instinct tells you it's right, then uh, you have to go with that. And he, he did. And uh, it, it's, it's continued to be successful or at least, at least sustainable. Uh, and, you know, um, the faith that customers have put in us have allowed us to keep developing new products and expand the, uh, the family to new things. And now we're getting into tube equipment with the new Pultec EQ and, and so forth. So it, it's, it's been a fun ride so far. Yeah. Uh, How did that come about? Actually, there's a, um, kind of a leap from going to well, from jumping into tube equipment, if you haven't made it before, yeah, to begin yeah. with. And, and I guess the second part of that is why a Pultec emulation? Well, we listened to our customers, and it's something that had been requested a number of times. Uh, you know, and we, we tend to, to listen to what people are interested in. Um, and, and you're right, from a manufacturing standpoint, it, it's even harder to do tube equipment and make it affordable to customers because... To do it right, you know, you're talking about large scale power supplies, larger capacitors. Uh, you know, it's, it's a higher voltage circuit, and it's it's even harder to do that well and and make it affordable. Um, now, everybody in the industry has made you know tube equipment for 20 years that is sort of tube in name only. And I'm sure, you know, I won't name names, but you you see it more there. It's a 16 volt wall wart, but it's got a tube in it. I mean, you know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, right. Right, there's not not, not a lot of plate voltage but, there, right? Right, yes, yeah, cathode follower they call it, or tube buffered output. It's a, it's a fancy word for a circuit that doesn't really need a tube, but but has a tube in it. Yeah, we didn't want to go that route. We wanted it to be real. It, it's a high voltage circuit. Um, it it actually, um, uh, it actually is is a more tube gain than an original Pultec. Actually, um, it's a so it, it's it's a pretty high end piece. Uh, the reason we did it. 
for one, it was something we felt there was a need for, aside from people asking for it. Um, I mean, as, as you know, Pulse tech, Techniques came back into business a couple of years ago and are reproducing the original Pulse Tech. Very fine equipment, very out of the reach for most people, including me. I, I can't spend $4,000 on a one-channel tube equalizer. And, yeah. uh, you know, and so there's an interest there. There always has been. Um, and, to you know, to get into a real tube product, you have to spend a lot of money. It's well over 1000 almost always. Um, and if you don't have that kind of money, you're left with the, the products we talk about, too, things that have tubes in them that are, that are gimmicky, that are low voltage and don't really, in, in my opinion, those types of circuits have all the negative qualities of tube and none of the positive qualities because it's not a, not a real tube driven device. So there was a need for people who were under the one that say the sub $1,000 market to, to be able to access the real thing, uh, and, and I think, you know, no one else was doing it yet. And we saw the opportunity to come in and do it. It's, it's been really successful. Uh, people uh, are buying those things, uh, you know, sight unseen just about. And we can't keep them in stock. So that was, a, I, think, I think it was a lucky move. Um, it was really interesting and coincidental that Pulse Techniques kind of came back into business around the time this was being developed. So it kind of stoked the fire and brought in some interest. Um and, and people who couldn't afford those prices uh, would naturally kind of gravitate toward us. So I think that was a, you know, it was, it was kind of a lucky coincidence there. Um, I still think it would have done well anyway, and, and it has. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it kind of it falls in line with exactly what we tried to do with the WA-76 and other things, to give people something really authentic uh, for, a, you know, a budget-conscious price. You know, a lot of people getting into recording today just don't have the money, right, uh, right. you know. To buy the expensive gear, uh, Chad. Wh which was the first product? Um, the WA12, the mic preamp. Okay. Uh, it um, that was was based on, like I said, the original sort of uh, API reconstruction. Um, it's, it's it's made on built on sort of a classic API design uh, with the Melcor 1731 discrete op amp, the original Reichenbach inspired input and output transformer. So. It's, it's not so much a reproduction of a new API as it is a reproduction of the very early API with kind of a little bit more of a warm, fuzzy tone to it than, uh, than the classic the classic that's in production now. Um, still very, very close. To me, revolutionary, like I told Bryce when we know, um, you know, I'm nearly 41. When I first started getting into recording in the early 90s, uh, I knew what discrete and class A were, and I knew that I couldn't have those things because I didn't have the money, you know, as a teenager. Um, and, and, you know, so you had to settle for what you could get, you know, some Digitech products and some, uh, an Aphex tube essence or an Art Pro MPA or, or whatever, like a Behringer Ultra Gain. It's like, that was kind of where I lived because you just sort of, it's kind of like, you know, the, the wealthy family across the street and how you wish you could have that house or whatever. To me, in the early 90s, that's how it was. You a, a teenager who was on a budget trying to record demos, you couldn't have class A discrete transformer coupled gear. You would read about it, but you couldn't have it. Uh, today, you can have it. It's within your reach. And it, uh, you know, and so, I mean, that's like a paradigm shift. Uh, people have it really lucky today. I, I don't even know if they fully appreciate that. Uh, they probably don't, and and that's okay. But the fact of the matter is, that the gear today is better than it's ever been from the standpoint that it's hard to buy something that's going to suck. You know, just about yeah. everything sounds at least reasonably good and passable that you can, you can make some, you know, pretty decent music. There was a point in time where if it was cheap, you know, it wasn't good. It just was not. Right. Or, or, or it was possible that you would get something that was a, a really, you know, a clunker. That yeah. being said, the consistency of products across the, you know, just about everybody's product line, at least, you you know, you'll find something that's going to work and there's going to be some things that are, are gems and, you know, Worm Audio has a lot of gems there. The WA-76, I just bought three of them, just, you know, oh, wow. as an example. Um, but again, 1176 for that price is just, uh, you know, amazing. Oh, I know. It's, it's, it's hard to beat. And, uh, and, and, and you know, and, and a lot of folks are saying, you know, we're not, we're not really competing with the classic, the classic products out there. You know, where I see a real value for that is uh, not only for the guys who can't afford, you know, an authentic URI 1176 restored or, or a modern UA version, you know, 
Um, what about the studios who, you know, are, are commercial facilities, $1,000 or more a day places where they actually can afford it, but say you don't want to have to buy 12 of them. Uh, you might buy one or two of those classics and then you can buy 10 more of the, of the WAs and they are so close. They sit right side by side with each other. And so, you know, I can remember being in bands and, and looking on the websites of studios saying, here's where I want to go. Look at, look at their gear list. I'm very much about gear. I know, I know you shouldn't be, it should be more about the producer, but it is what it is. And so I'm like, Oh, they've got a, a tape machine. Oh, they've got pull tech EQs. They've got a U87. Um, you know, so a large, a large studio can say, Hey, we have a, a restored 1176. We have a restored pull tech EQP one a, and we have 10 channels of that available or, or comparable, you know, yeah. uh, so, and, and I'm seeing that. So we're seeing pictures of people putting ours right up against the classics and saying it's just as good. Now I've got eight channels of the EQ I love, of the compressor I love. You know, and, and that's real flattery. I, I love to see that. Well, you, you know, there's an economics uh, question in there as well from the standpoint that it used to be if you bought a piece of outboard gear, you'd use it while you're tracking and you'd use it while you're mixing. And most mm -hmm. of the time, you don't do that anymore. You use it while you're tracking, and yep. chances are it won't see any kind of use during a mix because you're using plugins. So right. you're using it for half the time. So when you think about it, you think, well, okay, if I have something that's pretty much the same thing, and one cost me three thousand, the other cost me, you know, less than a thousand, which mm -hmm. way am I going to go? If as long as I, my clients don't, you know, respond negatively. Which in this yeah. case, you know, that's not the case at all. Right, right. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, and I kind of came from that same school. What, what I read a lot, well, you know, as, as an author, I'm sure, you know, a, a lot of recording textbooks were kind of influenced by the earlier days of A to D conversion, where it was kind of a lossy process, like a bucket brigade process, and you lost dynamic range and so forth. And so they would say, you know, and, you know, and Bob Katz's book is kind of definitely in that same school of thought where they say, do get all of your analog on the way in stay digital from there on out, you know? Uh, and, and I think that was always, always written as sort of a safety against people, you know, sort of, uh, having too much A to D and D to A conversion going back and forth. You know, and today it's almost, it's almost not ac applicable. And I wonder if people are too fearful about mixing outboard now because today's converters, uh, e even modestly priced ones are really good, you know, very clean, very linear, good dynamic range. Uh, you have to really look to find a bad one, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, no, uh, that's right. Even the cheapest ones are, are so much better than than even many of the high end ones. You know, just five years ago, it's amazing. Oh, I know. Yeah, and and uh, the semiconductor manufacturers have been doing a really amazing job. It's almost hard for the pro audio manufacturers to keep up with it because if you follow it, like Texas Instruments, Burr Brown, Phillips, these guys. AKM particularly, these guys come out with new model chips every year, and each each subsequent year beats the one from the previous year. And uh, and a lot of times it's hard to uh, to make a chip that's a drop in replacement for the last chip. And so pro audio manufacturers end up having to redesign products and come out with new product lines probably faster than they would like to. Uh, you know, and I experienced a bit of that with with my previous job. But, you know, the customer wins in that situation because it just keeps getting better and better. And, and it's getting more affordable. It's not more expensive. Like uh, I've had customers tell me, you know, both here and at my previous job that if the rest of the world followed Pro Audio, we would be having $1,000 cars and $10,000 mansions right now yeah. <laughs> because of the value that's been made for people. Tell me about the Tone Beast, the uh, TB12. It's very that's unusual. A really interesting preamp. Yeah. You're right. It's very unusual. Um, what that basically is, if you could imagine, and, and the and the TV12 is the closest thing so far to an original warm audio product, and, it, and by that I mean there's not a counterpart to it in the real world, um, even though its origins all come from the real world. And, and I'll explain that. The, the TV12 is kind of like, if you could imagine, a deconstruction of the whole API lineage. Uh, and, and most of the inspiration for it does come from that. Um, but to be able to sort of mix and match uh, the different components that sort of uh, comprise that preamp over the years. Um, you know, the, the closest thing I can find to it is like, uh, well, you know, you have preamps that give you, uh, like, say, uh, there's a company here, very high-end company there. I believe they're here in Texas, actually, uh, um, Shadow Hills Industries, where they were the first 
preamp maker th- that I saw gave you two different output transformers, like a nickel and an iron core, and you could flip a little toggle switch on the, right. the front and right. get the different ones. And since then, I've seen a few people follow suit. Um, you know, they were kind of the first to do that, uh, and, and now it's not so unheard of. And, and, you know, say Harrison consoles, I believe they came out last year with a preamp, with a box that had each generation of preamp all under the hood of of one box where you could have the earliest preamp to the latest and the ones in between. Um, You know, so these are similar uh, to what we did, but what we did is is still a bit unique. The TB12 is is just a one-channel preamp. You're never going to get more than one input or output out of it, Um, but it lets you pick and choose from the, the different stages that were made available over the years. You know, um, starting really with, with uh, the op amp, uh, the discrete op amp, there's an option for a vintage, which is a reproduction of the Melcore 1731, kind of like the grandfather of the API 2520, um, or the Dean Jensen 918. It was a discrete op amp developed by, by Jensen in the 80s. Very clean, transparent, very fast, uh, very modern. Um, so you can switch between those two. Uh, then you can actually switch capacitors. You can have a modern, which is an electrolytic capacitor in the audio path, which is very common. It's what you see in just about everything. Or you could have tantalums, uh, which is a little more vintage and esoteric. Uh, and we still use them on a few things, but um, in, in most products, you don't see them anymore. Uh, and that's a very subtle difference, but you have that option there. Uh, then you have the output transformer, and you actually have three options there. You can have no transformer. For just the most clean, fast, uncolored, you know, signal output you can get, um, or you can have an all steel output transformer where you get a little bit of low end saturation, harmonic distortion, or you can have uh, a nickel steel, what they call a high high nickel transformer, where it's part nickel, part steel. I think it's 50-50. Um, and that's just pretty much a flat quality output transformer, all cinematic. So there's there's three transformers in that box: a cinematic input and two cinematic outputs. Um, you know, so you have three different flavors for the uh, for the output, uh, and there's a few other little under the hood things in there as well. There's a tone switch that actually uh, changes the input impedance, uh, which is kind of based on how. If you ever seen some of the old Neve consoles where there was an input impedance switch that would switch it from say 300 to 1K, and it was for like attaching an old DI box to the input of the console or something like that. That's kind of what inspired that tone switch, and it does affect the tonality. Some people like it, uh, some people don't. It's just a way to uh, affect tone without having to use EQ or compression. Um, and there's a boost button, which actually uh, drives one of the op amps a little bit harder to give you a different kind of a character. Uh, another really cool thing on the TB12, and this is what, you know, as a fan and owner of API preamps, this is something I always felt was missing from the API. Uh, well, it's not missing from the API console because you have all this gain staging, but missing from just their standalone rack mount pre. And that's an output trim. Um, yeah. Anybody that uses API a lot, I think, knows that the real sweet spot is to drive the preamp up pretty hard and then to sort of scale it back. But they don't really give you an output trim on an API to do that with. So you're left recording at very modest recording levels and really never bringing the preamp into saturation. Um, so you get, you know, a very, just a clean, good sound, but some of the full potential isn't, you know, isn't as obvious to you. So we gave the TB12 an output trim. So uh, you can drive the preamp really hard and then scale it back for safe recording levels, but still get that sort of overdrive saturation where it, where it saturates the output transformer a bit and gets in, gets into harmonic distortion. So so basically, if you could imagine a, an API with the hood taken off and full control of every parameter, that's kind of what it would be. That's very cool. Uh, now, there, there's something I, I kind of missed. I was looking at the the website that was talking about that, and mm-hmm. it, it, can you drop in different um, uh, op amp modules? You sure can. You sure can. In fact, on the website, we have a partial list of everything that's compatible with it, and it's uh, it's the API footprint. You know, for the twenty five twenty. So you can put in an API. Um, you can put in. Uh, you know, if you can find some of these things, you can put in a vintage API. Uh, you can put in uh, the Avita op amp. You can put in, I believe, the John Hardy 990. Uh, you can put in, uh, that's the one that's in the John Hardy pre, the guy that makes the, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my, um, my favorite mic pre, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a, it is a great preamp, yeah. yeah. Um, which one, the John Hardy or the actual Jensen branded one? The John Hardy. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I know they're really similar. I think the yeah. Jensen just had one like unnecessary gain stage added to it or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, yeah. And, um, oh shoot. And there's a few more, there's a few more. And, and sometimes if you look on eBay, there's actually guys who make their own op amps that fit that footprint just to, on a hobby level, you know? Really? Uh, and so th- there's a lot of options out there. There's a few more I can't think of. Uh, oh, seventh circle audio. They sell one too. It's um, their own handmade, what they call an improved version of the API 2520. Um, there's the Avita op amp. I believe that one's also compatible. So I think in all, there's almost a dozen that you can drop in there. Um, the one, the ones we ship, I think are great. Uh, and I think the testimony, of, the testament to that is that very few people bother to, to try to upgrade it because we, we give you a pretty great reproduction of the Melkor and the Jensen op amp, which are, which are two of the most famous ones. Um, so the only thing to me, the only way you could really go up from that would be if you wanted the modern API sound, you could try to order a modern API 2520 if they would sell you one and drop it in there. Um, but, but yeah, there's quite a few. There's even an old Yamaha one that fits that uh, that fits that socket if you can find them. So really, it's, it, yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, so a lot of people do have fun with that. Um, I would say most customers are are thrilled with what's in there already, and they they don't worry about it. But it is there. Who's a typical customer for Warm Audio? Um, you know, from from the feedback we get, it's usually people who are younger and starting out in recording. Um, it's a uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting because the, the company I came from uh, before we did a study and we found that most of our customers were actually over 40. Uh, you know, they were, and it makes sense in a way. They were the guys who had got a career going and could afford to buy, you know, bigger gear. Um, the, the people that, that I talk to a lot are people, well, young and old, young and old, I would say, but people who are getting into recording more for the first time and they're looking at options that are out there and they're saying, well, I can't afford this. I can't afford that. Oh, but I can afford this. And so we talk to a lot of people where we're their first preamp. Um, and, and I love that, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and definitely uh, people who wear their first tube equalizer or 1176 or other type of outboard gear. Uh, you know, so it, it's, it's kind of cool that we're, in a way, expanding the market, bringing more people into it. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's a win situation for everybody. If you can kind of create your own customers and continue to grow it. Uh, and, and I've always kind of felt that about pro audio that I've always thought that if the, you know, the reason that you can go to Walmart and get, you know, a 76 inch LCD television for like $800 is because of incredible mass production and the efficiency that comes with that. If it were a niche market like Pro Audio, it, it would be a twenty thousand dollar television. I mean, you know that's true. Yeah. Um, so you know, the more people we can get interested in this, I think it helps everybody. Well, you know, the other thing too is you think of music, popular music, obviously, is this way where it, it's it's mostly for people that are younger, mm-hmm. you know, eighteen to twenty five, and that's where pop music mostly lives. Oh, but, yeah. but the fact of the matter is, and and, and if our industry and the, the the audio industry was just based on that. It would be small indeed. But the fact of the matter is, it goes way, way, way past that. Like you were saying, a lot of a lot of are older. It's it's funny. I was just I'm from Pennsylvania, and I was just back there recently, and I was talking to some people that I knew, and there was one person in particular. It's about I think he was 65, mm-hmm. a young 65. And um, he was saying, yeah, you know, I just retired and I'm getting into recording because I always wanted to do it. When I was younger, I wrote songs. I thought it was pretty good. I'm going to do it again. And this That's guy, right. he was a successful ex-colonel uh, in the Army, hmm. you, you know, who, who had a, a pretty good career doing that. But it was like he kept on saying, no, the whole time I was doing that, I really wanted to be a songwriter. So, wow. I, But the good thing about that is especially for – Warm audio and companies like that is the fact that the market has expanded where it's not just, you know, into a you know, single generation. It goes, you know, quite beyond mm-hmm. that. And, and you're right. It's, it's never too late. And, uh, you know, I have a good friend of mine um, who always who, who kind of mentioned this and it stuck with me that the, the older we get, the more life gets in the way of doing everything, yeah. um, everything that you want to really do. And, and I feel that as well. And 
I, I think just like that guy, it might be, it, I might have to wait until I retire to actually get a chance to do, do some of the things I want to do, you know? So I, I think it's actually a pretty common experience. Huh? Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, for a while, especially like high end audio guitars, everything, um, if you, I think if you look at it, the market is so much with, attorneys and yeah. doctors oh, yeah. and dentists uh, that have extra cash, you know, and all of a sudden are, are spending it that way. I know a lot of massive guitar collections go that way that, you know, many collectors are, are, um, not really players, you know, that that's right. Yeah. I actually knew somebody who collected bass guitars who, who couldn't play. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you're right, and, that, and that, those types of folks are also where, you know, the audiophile market lives, like uh, the, the doctors, lawyers, those are the guys buying the, you know, the $9,000 tube hi-fi monoblock systems and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and you're right, you know, in, in Baton Rouge, where I come from, there's, there's a studio uh, that has been producing records for this guy, and they're all great. They kind of sound like a modern take of the Beatles. Uh, and the guy is a lawyer, um, and he just likes making records for fun. I don't know if if he even tries to sell them really well. It's just but he can afford to do it and uh, keep the studio keep the studio busy making these records. So, yeah, and, and it's nice to be able to afford to do the things you love. Um, it, and it's certainly a lot harder to try to do it for a living, especially today. It seems like uh, one of the things I worry about is that you know you know when I was a teenager. It, it, it's, it's changed so much now. Like when I was a teenager, like you wanted to be in a band and the Holy Grail was to, to get this mythical record contract you could sign, sign your life away. You know, that was what everybody wanted to do. Um, where well, that's not even on the radar anymore. Uh, and uh, there are people that still want to be in a band, but they kind of, either they or one of their trusted friends basically has to run the operation. They make their own record. Uh, they book their own tour. It, it's all so sort of guerrilla tactic and DIY now. Um, I think that's interesting, but I still think it's getting harder and harder for people to make a living at it. I, I want people to still feel like they want to be in a band. Uh, and, and if, if people stop feeling that way, it, it would ruin, it would ruin things for everybody, including us, you know? Well, a lot of it has to do with, you know, the middle class everywhere is diminishing and, it's that yeah. way in the music business as well, where there were so many more people that were just making a living, you know, playing in clubs or whatever. And there's less, there's fewer now that can do that. You're, you're either, you, there's no middle ground. There's not as much middle ground as there used to be. You know, you That's either right. blow yeah. up. You talk about the working class musician. Yeah. And part of it has to do with, you know, that there's not many places to play or as many places to play as there once was. I, I, and you don't, you're younger than I am, but I go back to the days before the drinking and driving laws came in. That's what in many ways killed the middle class or it was the beginning of killing the middle class because up until then you had tons of bars everywhere and it was yeah. fairly easy to play four or five nights a week, even in a mediocre band and get paid for it and get paid, you know, reasonably well where you didn't have to have another job. The, right. yeah. the interesting thing about that was it was kind of like the farm team because you really got your chops together. You got good playing in front of people. And now, you know, there's so many mm -hmm. musicians that don't have that ability, which is a real shame, I think. That's right, yeah, and and the chemistry of uh, so many people are, are now becoming more isolated in the digital age, and the chemistry of sort of hashing out a song in the mini storage with three other guys is, is kind of becoming a lost art too, where people are sort of writing the song in their bedroom and programming the parts that they can't play, and and you know e even if it reaches fruition where they they get a band together, and like okay, here's the song, but that chemistry really isn't happening anymore either. Um, I, I never made the connection about the, the bars, but you're right. Yeah, that probably did really kill that that sort of thing. And in the early '90s, you know, uh, when I when I was there was a lot more of say the local rock bands than there are today. Now there's only just a couple. You were from or um, Baton Rouge, and uh, did you grow yeah. up there? Right. Sure did. Yeah, born and raised. Uh, I lived there 
up until really about a month and a half ago, a month ago, uh, when I moved here to the uh, outside the Austin area, Georgetown. Which is another fine place to live, by the way, so that's I that's okay. I think I'm fine. I'm, I'm liking it so far. I like it a lot. But uh, What I want to know, I was in Baton Rouge um, last year or the year before at Presonus because I was doing the, the book on the studio live console. Right. So I visited the factory for three or four days. The the new build the new building or the previous building? No, it was the previous building. Unfortunately, uh, the new on building. The floor, floor, floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was still there during. Well, I think they moved right after I left. Uh, I, I left around mid mid twenty thirteen. Well, the thing I want to ask you about Baton Rouge, though, I, I was really impressed with the music scene there. The first of all, I, I, am I. I don't think it was a Friday night. It was a Thursday night, I remember. But, you know, just walking down the middle of, of, of the main street there, there was lots of music going on. There were lots of bars. It was bands. It was singles, hmm. duos. And then uh, out in the town square, you know, there was a band that was playing. And lots of people around enjoying music. It, it was a wonderful scene. So that it was very cool in itself. But the other thing that I really noticed was the musicianship. The musicians were outstanding. Hmm. They had this kind of mix between technical ability and just hardcore funk. Mm -hmm. it, it was great. And, and, you know, of course, you get that in New Orleans as well. Which, oh, yeah. But I guess it's the, well, whole, so, yeah. the whole region there was just so outstandingly musical. I, I was really impressed, I got to say. Yeah, you know, I guess... Growing up there, I guess it never it never occurred to me to appreciate that maybe as much as I should have. Uh, I mean, ironically, you know, the whole time I was kind of preparing or contemplating moving here, everyone was telling me, oh, well, you'll love Austin. They've got the greatest music scene. They've got, you know, South by Southwest and Austin City Limits and, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of venues and all this stuff. So I was kind of looking forward to that, not realizing, you know, or not appreciating where I came from, actually. I guess... That's the case with anything. You you kind of don't notice what's around you. You notice what's what's presumed to be over the hill, I guess. You know? Well, you know, again, it, it's a comparison. If if you don't have light, you don't know what dark is. You know, right. and, and it's kind of like that in, in everything. One of the things I notice, I, I speak at colleges all over the world, so I get to experience music scenes everywhere. And, and there are pockets that are certainly they stand out from the rest. And like I say, Baton Rouge was one of them. And Austin, mm. of course, is another one. But there are places that you go that it's absolutely dead. Florida used to be actually a very good music scene, and that's kind of diminished over the last few years as well. You know, up until yeah. recently, you know, again, if you were a musician, you could play four nights a week and make a living. Um, a lot of people want to do that, and a lot of people don't. But even so... Uh, you could do that, and even that's fallen off in in recent times. So you know, that's what kind do of you different. attribute that to in, in Florida? Is it just the shrinking middle class, or uh... well, it seems to me that there's a class of well, it, there was always a lot of people that would go out, and regardless of your age, you'd go out three or four nights a week, and you go to bars. And I think that's dropped off for whatever reason. A lot of it might be, you know, the drinking and driving laws are yeah, even more stringent than they, they were. And, and, you know, you have to be afraid, even if you have one drink anymore, because we've all heard the horror stories, you know, oh, I only had one drink and I got a DUI. So uh, that, I think, has changed a lot. Um, but I don't know, because I don't live there. But I just noticed last time I was there, it, the scene had diminished somewhat. But Baton Rouge was great. Yeah, yeah. I bet that's part of it. You know, you know, four or five years ago, if you remember when the price of gas was extremely high, I kind of felt that that would, would you know, if literally people couldn't afford to go out. Um, I kind of felt like that would be almost the death knell, you know. Um, and, and thankfully, the price of gas has, has gone back down a little bit. Oh, it's high here in California. It's over $4 again. Oh, wow. Okay, wow. <laughs> yeah, well... well we have extenuating circumstances because there was an oil uh, refinery uh, fire and a couple of the refineries have temporarily closed for repairs. So I don't know if it's artificial or not, but it's expensive oh, here okay. again. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this has been a great talk. I really enjoyed speaking with you, Chad, uh, and getting the well, warm audio you. story. Um, one final question for you. 
you've been in the business for a while. You've been in the music business. You've been in the audio business. What's mm-hmm. the best piece of business advice that you've ever received from somebody or you've learned along the way? Oh, wow. You know, I've never, I've never had to stop and think about that. Um, well, it, it's, it's interesting, I guess. I, I guess uh, in business, you, you need to have a little more sense of modesty uh, than, than some people do. Um, when, I, when I started out, uh, you know, it, in my previous job, it was in the basement of an antique store. It was very humble. Um, and, you know, there, there were about 12 employees. And um, at the time, you know, I was, I was, you know, in my early 20s, and I didn't quite appreciate how, how cool that was, how fun to be a part of something that would later, you know, become a, a large international, you know, corporation, uh, that, you know, that did over 50 million a year in sales and so forth. Um, and, and I kind of wanted that experience again. I, you know, part of why I, I didn't hesitate much at the opportunity to, you know, to be a part of warm on essentially as the first employee, uh, you know, and to, to kind of witness that growth again. Um, but that being said, you can't help but not learn from some of the things you've been through. Uh, and, and, not, and, and, you know, at least there are a few places where I know to turn left when, when we had turned right, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I guess uh, it, you, have, you have to strive for growth and to, to improve yourself and just to, just to even stay afloat. If, if, you try to, if you try to be static, you'll fail. Um, you'll actually shrink, uh, you know, and I think everybody knows that. And I, I don't think you have to go to business school to know that it, it's, it's kind of common sense. But at the same time, I don't believe anymore that you should try to grow for the sake of growth, that you should try to become too big to fail because you can still fail in that attempt. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, you know, some of the, some of the things we went through the, the, the shaky, rocky road that, that was in part because of uh, being over ambitious, of trying to grow, uh, of trying to grow, of being so desperate to grow that you that you hire twenty people and then have to fire twenty more because you realize you you couldn't afford uh, to do that and couldn't sustain the growth. Um, I, I think that, and they learned that they learned that lesson as well, and 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 so have I. So. And, and thankfully, you know, Bryce and I are, are very hardworking, but but not ambitious in the greedy sense of, of just wanting growth for the sake of growth. We we won't make a product unless it's a hit, unless we unless it brings value to our customers, and our customers are asking for it, and they want it, and we feel it's justified and something that people will love to have. We, we won't do anything or make any decision just to enlarge ourselves just just to scale the company up that, that won't ever happen um we, we can stay modest we we don't have to uh take over the world or anything like that we, we just don't have those types of feelings and thankfully we're not under any pressure from you know from uh from any outside investment or, or banks or anyone that that would kind of force your hand into doing those types of things so we're, we're lucky in the sense that we don't owe anything to anyone and uh, so those types of things can be avoided. Um, that, that's the only thing. And so I don't know if that's advice, but I would guess just uh, be modest and and be willing to sort of accept your place in the industry at whatever whatever the cards are dealt and whatever that place ends up, you know, fate deciding to be. Be okay with that. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, if you're if you're doing something that you love and you're making people happy, that that's that's enough. You know, um, you. It seems like, especially in America, there, there's this uh, sort of business instinct that you've got to you've got to be focused on growth and to, to just that if you're not bringing something to the, the the biggest size it can be and making the most you can, that, that you're not doing your job, you know, uh, and that someone else should be brought in to do it. Yeah, I think that sense is wrong. Um, you know, so that's a long winded answer, but that's that's the only thing I have, I guess. And it's a good one. Thank you. Chad, thanks so much for being with me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it as well. Thanks thanks for the opportunity to talk. To find out more about Warm Audio, go to warmaudio.com. That's warm, W-A-R-M, audio, A-U-D-I-O dot com. That's all one word, warmaudio.com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, please send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. That's questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Many, many thanks to Steve Cherubino. He's the host of the EDM Producer Podcast. 
ADMMR. He helps put this show together. Many, many thanks, Steve. Finally, to listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes or Stitcher. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyoinnercircle.com, you'll find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time.